I, I don't know if you picked this up. Um, there's a theme. I tend to follow John like everywhere. We did our residency. I was one year behind him. We did our fellowship. I was one year behind him. He came back to UCLA. I was one year behind him. And uh, now I'm following him in presentations too. So um, a, a theme here, a theme. So what I wanted to talk about was, uh, you know, John discussed a lot of the, um, you know, benefits and technically what we do in the operating room and so forth. But I, w I wanted to give you a little bit of the data behind, um, uh, behind this approach and, and the benefits of this approach specifically. Um, so in 2014, um, a, a, the Cancer Center, Memorial Sloan Cancer Center, which I'm sure all of you know, they published this review article about all the results of the minimally invasive surgery approaches versus the open approaches for uh, the Whipple procedure. And that included both uh, laparoscopic approaches and robotic approaches. There were six studies included, um, 139 minimally invasive patients, 343 uh, patients that had an open procedure. And you can see in the red there, the outcomes around the time of the operation, they generally favor the minimally invasive approach. This is essentially the same thing as, you know, for the laparoscopic appendectomies and the laparoscopic cholecystectomies and the colon resections. It, it follows the same pattern. Um, you know, Dr. Reber, I'm sure, would be very happy the EBL favors the minimally invasive approach. Um, you know, the, the likelihood that we remove all of the cancer also favors the minimally invasive approach. We remove more lymph nodes with the minimally invasive approach. And then finally, as John showed, you know, our patients tend to go home maybe a day or two earlier than when you have the bigger incision. So <clears throat> this is some data. Um, John and I both trained at Pittsburgh uh, in our fellowship and doing this robotic surgery stuff. And they have the largest experience in the world with robotic pancreas cancer. So they compiled um, their patients of robotic, robotic pancreas cancer um, and, they, and they compared them to their open pancreas cancer patients. And, and the first two things I wanted to show you is just, again, a, a, a recapitulation of what Dr. Hines um, was mentioning earlier, which is patients do better, um, which is the higher line on these curves here. When, when they get chemotherapy, patients just do better. They live longer when they get chemotherapy. A and again, this higher line too, they do better when they have less complications. So it would make sense that we need to figure out ways that we can maximize these things um, and maybe potentially change our operative approach so that we can get these outcomes uh, to be present in our patients. As you can see, chemotherapy was the most important factor besides surgery to live longer, and then complications was the second most important. So with that in hand, we compared um, our, the, the, at Pittsburgh, they, I should say they compared, they compared their open patients to their robotic patients. You can see 70% of them got chemotherapy after surgery, but 82 of the patients that had the robot surgery got chemotherapy, and that was significantly different. Um, similarly, complications, 31% uh, in the open group, which is, you know, one in three, which is about normal, um, versus about one in five, you know, 18%, one in five. For, for the robotic approach. So again, these, this minimally invasive approach, this platform, the robotic platform, seems to be uh, an opportunity for us to affect outcomes such that we get patients to chemotherapy, which is really important for overall survival. And as you see here, I've written um, the likelihood of receiving chemotherapy was two and a half times as high when you have a robotic procedure, and you're half as likely to have a serious complication with the robotic procedure. And finally, what does this, does it translate to anything? Does it really translate to anything at all? And it seems like it does. Um, again, these are survival curve estimates. Um, this hashed line is the robotic group and the other line is the open group, um, the patients who had the open surgery. And um, at, at about five years, there's about a 35% chance of being alive when you have the robotic surgery and maybe, whoops, sorry, and about a 22% chance uh, at five years when you have the open surgery. And this isn't because the surgery itself is doing anything special, but it's because the surgery facilitates the other things that help patients recover quickly, 
um, get to chemotherapy, are stronger for chemotherapy, and so forth. Um, with, with this, you know, uh, I think uh, the group here at UCLA, um, you know, John and myself, as well as the support of Tim and, uh, and, and, and Dr. Hines, we all feel that this is something to cultivate in, in, in surgery and something that can be a useful uh, technique for, for our patients if they're appropriate candidates for the operation. Um, w with that, uh, I think uh, if, we have any if there are any questions um, for myself or Dr. King or Dr. Hines, we'd be happy to answer them. I'm a 40-year survivor. I had robotic uh, Da Vinci machine surgery on a uh, on seven degree occurrence of pancreatic cancer in the, uh, between the uh, um, chest wall and the heart, Dr. Sukasian at Cedar sinai My question to you, and it was successful, um, I'm here with nine degree occurrences, but my question to you is have you uh, gone beyond just whip over robotic surgeries to other types of uh, pancreatic cancer surgeries doing robotic surgery, like I've had. That, that, that's a very good question. C congratulations. Congratulations. Um, so happy that you could uh, get that procedure there and, and be so successful with it. And, and yes is the answer. Yes, we can absolutely offer it, mostly to anyone. Some, sometimes, like I was mentioned at the end, um, we deem whether it's appropriate or not based on um, where the tumor is and what it's involving, but essentially it can be done for any cancer, wherever it is, it, it, depending on the location of it and how extensive the surgery would be. Um, you know, if there were like significant blood vessels involved or something like that, that may be prohibitive. Um, but otherwise, yeah, we offer it for that as well as other things too. But, but yes is the, is the answer. I'm with UCLA now. Um, I so um, this will all be published very soon <laughs> and yes we looked at that too um, it seems to be less um, less um, significant, the robotic approach seems to be less significant. Again, the chemotherapy is extremely important for the patients, not necessarily what type of surgery they get. So whatever facilitates the chemotherapy is really the important part. So if they get chemo, if patients get chemotherapy before, uh, I, I would say that the approach isn't going to change anything all that much. Um, so yes, and that, and that has, and when we looked at that in the Pittsburgh group's database. That's what we found, essentially. So the chemotherapy is really the key. I don't want to oversell robotic surgery at all. It's, it's the surgery and the chemotherapy. Uh, who and how is it decided who gets a robotic surgery versus a physician surgery? So very good question. Um, as has been alluded to earlier, um, uh, with guidance from Dr. Donahue and Dr. Hines and Dr. Reber, of course, who started the program, we have a group of physicians, which are essentially the five of us here today, and, and we decide. We decide together um, who is appropriate for it and not. Um, again, uh, you know, Dr. King and I are starting this program, so we are selecting patients with um, our our senior members uh, more carefully. Um, we're, we're not cavalier at all, uh, and... Um, that, that those are mostly how the decisions are made. Yes. If you haven't, if you've done pre-surgery chemotherapy and the tumor itself is not obstructing anything, why would you do surgery? Say, well, I'm sorry, say that, the, the, say it again, it, one The data seems to show that if you continue chemotherapy as, as long as possible and you don't have long delays and, you, uh, and you're doing surgery after pre-surgery chemotherapy, why would you do any operation and delay chemotherapy, put a stop to chemotherapy, it's, if, it's not, if, the, if the tumor itself is not causing any damage and it has, in fact, shrunk? So I, I, may, I may have be, been a little bit mis, uh, miscommunicated a little bit. The chemotherapy is one of the most important factors, but it, it's only in conjunction with surgery. You, you, you cannot be cured of this disease without surgery, so you need both.
Yes, we are, att we are curing people with chemotherapy with the surgery, both together. Pardon? Oh, we don't, I'm sorry, we don't do it for patients with metastasis. Is that what, was that what your question was? I apologize, I apologize. Yes, we don't do it for that reason because I agree with you 100%. It doesn't help uh, in general to do a big operation like this when you have disease that is spread outside of the pancreas. Yeah, apologies. Um, is, it, is it an assumption when you go in that you're going to do a Whipple or can you go in and at the time determine whether uh, the, 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 the growth is removable? Yeah, so um, that's a very good question and um, a, a alluded to earlier in what Dr. Hines was talking about, which is our imaging tests prior to surgery are so good now that we get a really good sense of whether we're gonna be able to remove something or not. Um, there are those instances still um, a low percentage that we go in there and we dissect and we assess how close they are to those big structures that Dr. Hines was alluding to, the artery and vein that go behind the pancreas, which preclude uh, resection. Um, but generally, we're able to under know that beforehand with our imaging studies. And, but, and the imaging has improved so much, the so much. Um, the 15 years, the last 15 years specifically, yeah. Oh, sorry. What impact on surgical time is there to do it robotically versus standard? Yeah, that, that's a great question. Thank you for thank you for asking it. Um, so early, I'll tell you because the the again the group from Pittsburgh has the most extensive experience. They've done over 600 of these operations, 600 in about seven years now, or or eight years, um, 600 operations and. And what they saw was when they started, they were operating for about 10 hours on average. But now, <clears throat> they're at about five to six hours, five and a half hours, which is about what most people would say takes for the bigger procedure. This is, a, it, there's a learning curve to it, definitely. And that learning curve for this surgery appears to be close to 80 cases, 80 surgeries or something like that, where a group like myself and Dr. King or something like that, where our times will be um, close to where they would be if we were doing the procedure open. 